here's injected molded plastic. Just make sure to verify it's not real. Because I'm not okay, pointing at you. See this thing. California compliant. Kind of, this is California compliant. <laughs> right, we can sell that all day long. Okay, so uh, Mr. Roy, when I when I'm a threat, I want you to tell me to stop. Okay. Yeah. When I move, I want you to tell me to stop. Okay, you ready? When I move. Stop. Okay. We'll do, we'll do it again. When I move, tell me to stop. Stop. From the s to the p when we start breaking this down, you have no chance of reacting faster. Okay, than I can act. And we're back. And today I'm joined by our good friend. Jeff MD, our own in-house 007, and my good friend Randy Nance from Dallas Fort Worth. Randy, how you doing? Good. How are you? What happened to your hair, man? Did you wash it? It shrunk or what? Oh man, you know I had to finally get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all caught me on the last recording at just the very end of me growing everything out, till I just couldn't take it anymore. But you know it finally got there, so I'm happy with it now. <laughs> Barely even recognized you. Anyway, th today's topic, we're going to be discussing all things training. So training implements, tools, we're going to talk online training, in-person training, free training, paid training. We we discussed this subject a lot on Survival Dispatch News, but today we're going to actually put some meat on the bones. However, before we do that, since Mike Sterling is blowing stuff up in Myrtle Beach at this time, I will do the honors for him. And it's a doozy. After being unjustly kicked out of your survival group and betrayed by your friends, you were left powerless against them. There is an opportunity to turn them into your enemies, or their enemies, I should say. This would put you at a great advantage and bring your friends down. Would you do it? Yes or no? And why? That is a good conflicted question right there. Yes. So anyway. <laughs> let's let's jump right in on the training and Jeff made the suggestion that we start you know with relatively innocuous stuff and then go up from there so first things that I want to discuss with y'all is the benefits of having flashlights beyond just being able to see stuff Jeff do you want to do you want to start on this like what makes a good pocket tactical flashlight and what the benefits that there are of yeah, a flashlight is is a multi tool. Don't think of it as just a flashlight. It is yes, it's a flashlight to see in the dark. You shine it in someone's face, it 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 messes up their OODA loop. It you know they have to look, they have to deflect their vision once, especially at night because you know their eyes are set for the dark. You hit them in the face with a flashlight, they're blinded temporarily. So that gives you an advantage. Um, but it's also if it fits in your hand properly. It's, you know, it's like having a roll of quarters. It's a weapon. It, it, what it does is it increases your strike force if you have to hit somebody because it's like having a metal, a metal bar in your hand. So it's, it's a multiple tool. And the advan other advantage is you can take it anywhere. It's not a weapon. You can have it clipped on your belt. You can have it in your pocket. That if you're a place where you had to, you know, they don't allow, you know, weapons or anything of any kind, you can still have a flashlight in your pocket. And so you're not, you know, you're not completely helpless. It includes a very simple tool. Including traveling on planes. Absolutely. You know, better than nothing. Randy, what are your comments on flashlights? Well, it's a, you know, I, I would just echo what Jeff has said. You know, it's, it's not only a tool that you can use to see with, uh, but you can also use to disorient uh, the bad guy, so to speak. Or, I mean, it's a weapon, like he mentioned. You know, that's why the police use those big mag lights. They don't just use them to point and use the light. They will clock someone over the head with it if they have to. Yeah, that, that just reminded me. I've, I've got a flashlight over here that I'm going to grab. I, I'm not aware of a lie. There's at least 50 flashlights in my office. <laughs> we're, we're getting ready to do the mother of all flashlight videos. But let me grab this. Um but if you have a flashlight, you have one that has enough lumens that if you do shine it in someone's face, it'll disorient them. You know, a little, you know, one AAA battery light's not going to do it. Yeah, like this. I mean, this is a, a flashlight. I think we got it at a truck stop because we couldn't find one in the truck readily. It, it, 
you know, that doesn't really do it any justice there. It's not very bright when you compare this to something else. It weighs next to nothing, pretty small. It, it's not like an actual tactical flashlight, like an EDC sure. tactical flashlight like these guys. Um, I agree with what you guys said, OODA loop in particular. So uh, observe, orient, decide, act. Everything we do is based on the OODA loop. So if you can interrupt somebody's thinking, they're in the process of, you know, they're getting ready to attack you. You just took away their element of surprise, essentially, right? Um, yep. This guy here, $29 flashlight on the Amazon. Uh, it has several different modes, you know, strobe, bright, so on and so forth. But it also has, it's a it's a basically a stun gun as well. But it look, just looks like a flashlight and you can wear it in a holster on the side for $29 pretty effective i don't know if you could get this on an airplane i'm not counseling anybody to do that but even like the smaller ones you can see how it has you know a serrated end essentially so if you get smacked in the face with something like that it's probably not going to feel too good right no. so <clears throat> moving on from flashlights jeff we've had a couple discussions recently on things like pepper spray and we we like the products from saber we, we bought a bunch of these small ones so we could practice with them because every product's going to, you know, operate slightly differently, different ranges. You've got some uh, pepper spray stuff that you carry as well, Jeff. Do you want to start yep. there? Um, we've got, I bought them from myself and my wife. They're sabers. They're about yay big. Uh, and they attach to your keychain. And then there's a quick release that you just push a button and you have it without the keys. Um, but you take that everywhere, put it in your back pocket. If something, uh, you know, makes your skin crawl or, you know, the hair on the back of your neck stand up, you just get your keys out. And with your keys is pepper spray. Um, and you're always taking your keys with you. How many times do you leave your house without your keys? You may forget to take something else. You may forget to take a flashlight. Um, you know, how, you know, a lot of times I, I'll carry, but a lot of times I don't. But if you always have your keys, you always have something. Yeah, good point. Got the pepper spray, Randy. What are your What are your thoughts on pepper sprays and pepper gels? Because they're not the same thing. No, well, I do like pepper spray too because one, it's it's a a chance. Uh, if you have to deploy it, you know, it's a chance for you to separate yourself from the the bad guy, and you can then leave. Uh, that's what the intent is. Pepper spray is not meant for you to stay and fight. This is for you to separate yourself from whatever's going on and get out of there. Dis distance equals safety. That's I, right. That's I got right. a good friend of mine was a paramedic in Bradley County, Tennessee for years. His name's Lane Kelly. And he got called to a scene uh, this one night and there were some belligerent people. And then the cops were called <laughs> and Lane was a pretty big boy. He was like 300 pounds and he's wrestling around on the ground with this guy and trying to get him into a headlock and the cop is wrestling around with them as well. And he pulls out his pepper spray <laughs> and Lane turned his head just as that guy pulled the trigger and he doused him in the face with it. Uh, and it wasn't a good time at all. Uh, have either of you been hit with CS or pepper spray? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've done both the training in the military where you have to go through the little CS tent, but I've also been in a training where I got sprayed by a little device like you just had. And I, I've been, uh, I was also tased in that same course. And I, uh, now they only rotated it once on the tase. So I would much rather be tased. I don't want, let me just put this out there. I don't want to get either one, right? I don't want to be tased or sprayed. But if I had a choice, go ahead and tase me again, because that spray is the gift that keeps giving. It doesn't go away in five minutes. You're That's talking right. an hour and a half later, it's still lighting you on fire. So do you remember Trader's Village in Grand Prairie years ago? Oh, you know, yeah, Michael absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I was there in 1989, and, and stun guns were just kind of coming to market. And yeah. this guy had one sitting on a table, 9-volt battery hooked up to it. And I looked at my buddy, Mike Dawkins, and I said, what's that going to do? And he said, well, I don't know. He says, I've never tried it. He was setting me up. And the guy behind the counter was like, well, you want to try it? I'm like, yeah, 9-volt battery is not going to put me down or anything. <laughs> so you guys know already know by now I am the, the official crash test dummy for Survival Dispatch. And I guess it started all those years ago in 1989 because he put me on my ass pretty oh, quickly, yeah. but 9-volt yeah. battery or not. So let, let's move up to the next level. And again, we're discussing training implements to start with. 
then we'll be talking training regimens of programs after that. So uh, the next thing that we've got on the list is airsoft pistols. <clears throat> so you can get these for $20, $25 on Amazon. Yes, the trigger is not going to be anything like a real pistol, but utilizing this <clears throat> to train drawing from your, your holster or concealed, however you carry it, and going through the basic mechanics, certainly better than doing nothing at all. Like all the guys that I know who are lightning fast at drawing from appendix carry have practiced it tens of thousands of times, not thousands of times, tens of thousands of times. I know a couple guys who can draw from appendix and get their first shot on a shot timer it just in the blink of an eye. I can't even tell you what the, the time is because it happened so fast. Uh, what are your thoughts, guys, on on training with something like this, which is, it, it's not really a toy, but it's kind of a toy. Um, there's no point in training on one of those if you don't have a real one somewhere. Um, you know, train on an airsoft, if you don't have a real gun, what's the point? So you have a real gun, but you don't want to train, do, you know, drawing and things like that in your house necessarily. You may have kids or something like that. Or you, you know, but it's a great way to get your mechanics down. Um, you want to be, when you draw, you know, get your sight, picture a whole nine yards, you want that to be automatic. And that can only be that way if you just practice it, practice it, practice it. You can get into bad habits. You talked about the, you know, the double tap type thing. And, you, you know, there's a cop who will shoot twice and then reholster. Well, the guy's not down yet because they've had a, a bad habit of only shooting twice. But drawing, you know, setting a gun, get a good grip, and, you know, that's going to be the same no matter what. So that is a, a schema. That is a, a something you want burned into your brain. And that's the best way to do it. The easiest, cheapest, and safest way to do it. Randy? Yeah, and I, I would definitely say if you're a beginner you or you've never held a gun, period, it's probably a good idea. I mean, they look, like you said, it looks like a real gun, mostly acts like a real gun. But the biggest part of it is, well, if you're trained with, you know, if somebody's moving their gun, pointing all around like this, you know, you don't want to do that with a real gun. You want to learn, as Jeff said, those mechanics and those safety things that you're going to do so that you're not pointing a loaded gun at everybody when you're not, you know, certainly if you have no awareness of, of having a gun in your hands and just how serious that matter is, even if it's unloaded, you know, well, it's a good place to start. I don't know about you guys, but whether we're training with less lethal or not, if somebody flags me with a pistol or a rifle, it freaks me out. Oh, it's it like, should. Oh, yeah. time out. It doesn't matter that this is not a lethal gun. You can't do that, right? There, there's another well, piece. In the military, that's how you get kicked off a team. That's sure. what happens. Well, yeah. yeah, my wife gets freaked out. I'll have a go shooting and I'll have my, my AR completely broken down. The barrel is sitting off by itself <laughs> and she still will not walk around there because it just <laughs> makes her uncomfortable. That's a, that's a good habit to be in. It is. That's it's a, a really, good habit to be in. Yeah. Really, really good habit to be in. And so I got one more thing with this and this is not a joke, by the way, I actually bought this particular pistol at Mike Sterling's recommendation over a year ago, two years ago, maybe something like that for stress inoculation. So I'm always looking at interesting ways to crank up, you know, the stress level while training. And Mike was the one who mentioned when he was at crisis application group, they would use these with steel or aluminum projectiles and not plastic projectiles to shoot people in the ankle while they're training with something else. And you want to talk a painful distraction, get shot yeah. in the Achilles tendon with one of these while you're training with some other type of, you know, a dry fire pistol, rifle, whatever the case may be, it's a uh, boy, howdy, it doesn't tickle, especially. Well, I guarantee you that does not feel good at all. No, no, it doesn't. At the end of the day, one of the things though we want to accomplish, and we've discussed this in, in today's episode, is that there are a range of things that people can do. You don't have to have an unlimited budget. You can, you can do a lot of this stuff on a small budget, whether it be buying implements like this, or flashlights or pepper spray it's not not super expensive but you can also benefit from it like jeff said you get your mechanics down pat or you have some sadistic person like uh mike sterling who takes it upon himself to shoot you in the ankles while you're training with something else so moving on from there so this is a 
a Mantis X10 dry fire uh, training device. And it's not super sophisticated, but it's it will track the path of the barrel before and when you pull the trigger. It will track if you've cantilevered the gun. It'll track if you're pulling too hard with your finger. It's actually pretty good at giving you uh, corrections on those mechanics, as you mentioned, Jeff. And with these, with this particular product, the Mantis X10, you know, you can see it slid off. You just put a, a an adhesive pick rail on anything. You can run this. That's a Glock 19. So you can run it on a, a pistol. You can run it on a rifle. You can run it on a shotgun. You can run it on a longbow, crossbow, whatever you want. Then you go into the settings for the app, tell it what you're shooting, and it it picks up the trigger pull by an uh, auditory signal, like sound signal, I should say. But this magazine that I have in this Glock 19 is from a, a different company called Dry Fire. So this didn't come with the Mantis X10. So it's a $98 product, if memory serves me right. And essentially what it does is it actuates the trigger. And that's pretty important. You guys have heard the story before, but I'll tell it relatively quickly. So in this particular case, this has a three and a half pound trigger in it. And it's pretty tight. There's barely any take up before you hit the wall. But you heard the trigger reset, reset again, reset again. So a lot of dry fire training products, you shoot, you charge the rail, you shoot, you charge the rail. And the problem with that is you're burning neural pathways that every time after you take a shot, you need to shuck that rail. And I can tell you from doing stuff like triple tapping for weeks on end with the big brother to this guy, the Blackbeard X, that when I got into a competition where it was one shot, sprint 50 yards, one shot, sprint 50 yards, I couldn't stop triple tapping to save my life because I've been doing it five days a week for three weeks. So shooting, shocking, shooting, shocking, not good to get into, but for relatively little amount of money, having this to reset your trigger is a godsend. Uh, Jeff, give me your thoughts on dry fire training in general, because this is the entry level. This is This is where it starts. Yeah. And, you know, that's, it's not that expensive. And if people say, well, I can't afford that, whatever they cost, you can get discount codes for them or anything else. But then ask yourself, well, how much does ammunition cost? And then you've got to, you got to drive to the range and you've got, you know, it, it can be an ordeal depending on where you live. You may have to make an appointment, you know, at a, at a gun, at a gun range somewhere. But if you can just dry fire in your house or in your backyard, it saves you money pretty quick, If depending on how much you shoot. So, yeah, I mean, what, $99 for some of this stuff? And, yeah, yeah. it's uh, yeah, it, it's cost effective. Depending on which one you choose, anywhere, say, from $100 to $250. But it, it's definitely the gift that keeps on giving because you can use it over and over again. Uh, they just charge up by USB. Uh, the only downside to these little guys, they don't have a very strong Bluetooth modem in them. So if you're running and gunning, whatever you have this Bluetooth to, you have to have on your person. You can't leave it back at home base like you can with a Blackbeard X, which we'll get into next. But at the end of the day, like you said, Jeff, this is, this is great uh, as far as practicing your mechanics over and over again. You get to use your trigger pull on your pistol. So it, that's why this is a step above using the airsoft because anybody who's bought these cheaper airsoft know that, you know, that's not giving you any, uh, you know, you're not real feedback. Yeah. You're not getting real feedback exactly from the trigger. Randy, what are your thoughts? Well, it's, you know, shooting is like many things that take practice, repetition, 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 and, you know, and consistency. That's how you get better. Uh, even in the military, even the private and the infantry or at any level I was at, there was dry fire training. There's a reason for that. Uh, it also helps, you know, a lot of people that haven't shot a lot, they'll anticipate. They start pulling that trigger and, you know, your head starts thinking, oh, man, this gun's about to kick. And they'll they'll anticipate it and move forward a little bit. Dry firing is one of those things that you can get over the, the flinching of when you're pulling the trigger with a live round. It's one of the ways. So I, I've always been a big proponent of dry firing because, again, it comes down to just what you said. You're not, you know, professional shooters shoot. You know, everybody's seen professional shooters. They hit everything one armed and behind their back, under through their legs. But it's because they shoot 50 or 60,000 rounds a year. 
right. every year. So not everybody has the money to do that. Most people, in fact, don't. And it comes down to money. You're not going to be able to buy rounds to go shoot for all that you need to practice. So dry firing is, is again, one of those basic fundamentals you need to start with. Certainly if you haven't been a shooter or don't have any experience with a gun, uh, but even people that are experienced still get value in that training or we wouldn't have done it at all the levels I did in the military. It would, you're not going to do something that's, that's a waste of time. Yeah, that, that's well said, Randy. I mean, it's uh, these are perishable skills. Yes. So if you don't use them and practice them on a regular basis, yeah, it's kind of like riding a bicycle will come back to you. But if you don't train on a regular basis for an extended period of time, did you all see the 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 truck jacking last weekend that happened where uh, the person, you know, uh, carjacked this work truck, like a one ton dually with all the boxes around it. And one of the construction workers was five feet away from the bad guy, you know, jacking it and shot at him a couple of times, missed him at point blank range. The guy backed up 100 feet, gunned it, ran him over and killed him. Like he bounced off the front of that truck like he was a, a rag doll. Uh, point being is that if you're not shooting on a regular basis and then the shit really hits the fan, your heart rate's 140 to 180 beats per minute. Pretty, pretty hard to connect, right? 90% of citizen involved shootings are happening inside of 10 feet and less than 20% actually connect with the target. So I tell people all the time that, you know, most civilians, if you've gotten a gunfight, you're going to expend an entire magazine and not hit one thing. Quite possibly. Yeah. It, it, it happens all the time. Well, hey, police do it. I mean, Ron White, the comedian, yeah. had, a, had a bit about. He says there was a shooting in Texas and they, you know, says there was like 46 rounds fired at point blank range and nobody hit anything. That's right. He talks about his son. He goes, out, he says, Better go shoot that man in the head. Uh, he, says, he says, my kid could do better than that. But yeah, stress is, you know, you want to say, call it the great equalizer. It's, it's the great debilitator. You yes. can be mechanically the best on the planet, but if you've never fired, had to worry about firing that gun in anger, or where you're going to have someone shooting back at you. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah it's no, not the same. We're back to Mike's favorite quote. Human beings never rise to the occasion. They fall to their level of training. Yeah. So if, if you've never taken your stress to that level while you're training, uh, the chances that you'll perform are slim to none. And and stress could be a couple different things. Like you just described, you know, you're in fear for your life, obviously, stressful situation. But another example, Randy, you would know because you do a lot of physical stuff like Tough Mudders and whatnot. When you get your heart rate up over 130, 140 beats per minute, it's your accuracy. Exactly. Your accuracy is. It you takes your fine it, motor it, skills. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's a fact. It's certainly <laughs> a gunfight. Uh, you talk about the guy missed the, the bad guy five or 10 feet away when he shot several times. And it's because now your hands are shaking and, you know, when you got a pistol, man, you've got a short platform to line up. It's very, very easy to miss. And if your hands are shaking, you you won't be able to hit anything sitting right in front of you. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I also think, you know, just based on that comment, that another, <clears throat> excuse me, another part of practicing is what's referred to as predictive shooting, right? So, in other words, if if you have the same grip every single time and you pull the trigger and it comes right back to where it always belongs, then your chances of getting shots on target are that much better. And that's probably like the one usage scenario where I like to have a laser on a gun. So I can shine the laser on the target, shoot a live round. Of course, we're going to have a little bit of muzzle flip, but is my grip consistent enough that that laser comes back to the same spot every time so that there's that predictive element and, yeah, I mean, well said on your part, Randy. Let me let me grab the next one over here. Um, this this is a step up for uh, for the Mantis product. So this is the Mantis X Blackbeard X. So it takes two seconds to take the BCG bolt carrier group and charging handle out, and use the Mantis uh, magazine. So the magazine's a battery and a Bluetooth radio, a lot stronger than the Bluetooth radio in this. You can be a long ways away from whatever you're Bluetooth with, with this and, and still do your running and gunning. Uh, the advantage to this is that it, same as with the dry fire mag, it resets your trigger each time. So you're using your trigger. 
I mean, it literally takes less than 60 seconds to flip this back, put the BCG charging handle in, load a mag in it, and you're back to being deadly force. But again, you're using your trigger all the time. In addition to the fundamentals of are you cantilevered? What was your barrel travel before and during the trigger pull? This guy has settings in here, small Allen key to adjust the windage and elevation of a laser on the end. So you can download targets for free from Mantis X or you can buy them. They'll ship them to you. Put your phone on a tripod with the camera facing your target and it'll pick up the laser hitting the target. So you, all of the regular drills that you would run live fire, like bill drills, box drills, pyramid drills, all those sort of things you can do with this. And you can do it inside your house. You can do it in your backyard, whatever the case may be. And Randy, we're kind of back to, you don't have to find or Jeff, a range that has, you know, um, action bays where you can actually do whatever you want. You can drive your truck out there, shoot out of the truck. You can run from one location to another and shoot. Uh, this allows you to train in that manner inside your home in your backyard. And I can't tell you how many thousands, literally thousands of hours I have on one of these. If there's a downside to this, and then I'll turn it over to y'all. Once you start shooting above 90 percent consistently so most of the time with this i'm shooting in the 92 to 95 percent range not because i'm some great marksman but because i have a gazillion reps on this you kind of plateau it, get, it gets hard to go beyond that so i have a solution that we'll cover shortly but I, i'll tell you what this particular device did more for my accuracy and consistency in shooting ars than anything else i've tried uh jeff Give, me, give us your thoughts on moving up from, say, pistol dry fire training to SBR training. Well, you, you think about what are your possible scenarios you may run into that you may actually, actually use a weapon. And it boils down to a rifle or a pistol. Um, and if you're good at one, you need to be good at the other. And um, I mean, I've said in other shows, I said, you know, ideally, you have one pistol round caliber and one rifle caliber, so you don't minimize the amount of ammo you got to have laying around. But it, taking your point, hey, I would kill for ninety-two percent. You know that that's good enough for me. I mean, yeah, I'd like to be a hundred, but if you can get up into the low nineties using a Mantis product, you're, you're ahead of the game. You're you're better than ninety-nine percent of the people out there, probably. That's my score on this. That's not my score in real life, just to be clear. I wasn't. Well, no, I understand that. But I mean, if you're getting the you're getting the neural pathways burned, you're getting the habits formed that allows you to get 90s. You're ahead of the game is you're not, you know, most people you pick it up, you know, and they did it. They'd be probably in the 50s or 60s if they're lucky to start. Well, I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but I have a friend who, I, I kid you not, has the fastest draw from appendix carry of anybody I know. I mean, it's lightning fast, but he doesn't train with ARs, whether they be SBRs or carbines. And we had a competition, a couples competition. So my wife and I versus two other couples, and it was running and gunning and doing physical exercises in between sets so that your heart rate's high, you're getting the physical exhaustion. And that guy's a great guy. He's very talented. He's been a talented athlete, but they had never trained with something like this. And they scored in the 60s and low 70s. And uh, Jason Sawyer and his wife, Christy, they're darn near 20 years younger than Cindy and I. And they scored, I, I want to say, like right around 90. And Cindy and I were like one or two points behind them. Uh, so it really is a matter of practice makes perfect. Like if you're not training with a particular implement, you're not going to pick it up and be all of a sudden good with it, especially under stress. No, you, if you, yeah, if you have a system, you need to be, or a weapons platform of any kind, you need to be proficient in it. And that requires training and repetition. And yeah, you know, a, a movie analogy is the old Quigley down under the very, you know, he's this long distance sharpshooter. And then, uh, you know, uh, Alan Reichman, you know, they, he wants to do a, an old West draw. Well, and then quickly blows him away. And he says, because he'd always said, yeah, six shooter never had much use for one. Well, he <laughs> says, I didn't have much use for one. Did say I did not use it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but he was equally proficient. He had his primary weapon, which was the long, you know, the Henry rifle. Yeah. And then he had his other one, which he was pretty damn good at. 
That, yeah, that, that's a good analogy. Hey, Randy, before you expand on dry fire training, I, I want to mention that uh, my stepson is serving at uh, Fort Benning in Georgia, and he's an instructor now. But before he became an instructor, uh, you know, he was infantry. They use this exact same system. He sent me videos of them using the Mantis X Blackbeard X for a lot of their training. Now, this wasn't around when you were going, you know, to selection and, and went through be becoming a Green Beret. But you've dry fire trained with ARs. You know, tell yeah, me no. what your impressions were. No, I do like it because it's the same reason the military does it. And at, at all levels, whether you're in the infantry or in special operations, you're going to do some dry firing. You're going to do live fire. Uh, you're going to do all of that. And one of the things I like about this platform is you're using the same weapon system. You basically got that as your weapon system. Like if if this was real world and you picked up the real weapon, it's the same one. Might be a little difference in weight, but the fact is that's the same trigger, the same handle, the same foreguard. It, it's all the same that you're already using. And that is important, as we said, because repetition, repetition, you want good habits. Because when that adrenaline kicks off, happy, whatever you've been training, whether it's good habits or bad habits, that's what's going to come out. And really, certainly in that moment that happens right in the beginning, there's like three or four seconds that you have no control over what your body's going to do. Your brain kicks in for you and you do what you know you're supposed to do. That's why we always had to train exactly perfect. And if you made a mistake, you had to go back and do it like 10, 15, 20 times to erase that mistake. And so that mistake would come out if you get an adrenaline so using yeah. something that like this is going to simulate the exact weapon you're using is uh pretty much priceless in my opinion because like you said really you need to have one of each you know in today's time you know you, you might want to know how to use a uh, uh some kind of high-powered rifle or an assault rifle because you know what if it's a group of folks you know back in historic times for us you were, drawing, you were thinking about people just breaking into your house and it's going to be one or two bad guys. That's a whole different situation than if you get, you know, a mob of 30, 40, 50, or 100 people all of a sudden coming down the street. Uh, you're going to want something that, you know, that, that has a high capacity magazine where you can at least defend yourself and your property. Yeah, that, that great comments. Hey, um, back it, to your... Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say, it's, this is almost like a civilian version of miles gear you know you're not shooting other people but right. it gives you that simulated you know you can move and shoot and know if you're hitting the target and you know doing it without expending around yeah, and you come up with all kind of scenarios so you sure come to your bases which, which is key scenario training and we're going to get into that uh jeff further to your point so as you can see on the screen 319 dollars for the That's top definitely. of blackbeard x so this is a 300, 300 blackout. That's no more expensive than 15 boxes of ammo, 20 rounds per box. Yeah. And it doesn't take long to go through 15 boxes of live ammo when you're training <laughs> at all. So <laughs> the, this is literally in one training session, one decent training session. This is more than paid for itself, just in the ammo cost, not including the convenience factor of being able to train in your home, which is where you're, you know, you want to be proficient in case somebody breaks in or in your backyard because maybe you don't have time to get to a range where you can actually run and gun because standing at the shooting line, there's some stuff you can do. I mean, Mike Sterling, he likes to put the target and we've gone shooting together. So I've, I've seen this firsthand. He'll put the target at the end of the indoor range. Let's call it 75 feet and he'll get set up and ready. And then he'll say to me, OK, go and I'll push the button on the carrier and it'll bring that, you know, target back. And you can set the speeds on the ones that Volusia Top Gun, and it'll bring it back fast. And yeah. so the entire time, he's doing a mag dump while the target's getting closer to him. Pretty smart, you know, for uh, basically being, like being charged. That's yeah, right. You, you, yeah. And, and you're, you're not breaking the range rules by doing that. But, and, you know, unless you have private lanes, being able to pull from a holster in a, in a range, that's not going to happen. And believe it or not, even somewhere like Volusia Top Gun, where you're not allowed to pull from a holster, you have to have it on the sitting on the counter because there's 16 other people, or if there's two per lane, 32 people in there. What do you think the number one thing is that gets shot in the range that shouldn't be shot? The like, carrier. 
The oh, counter, the table? The counter. Yeah, every yeah. single time. Yeah, it, yeah. It's crazy. There was a guy just like funny anecdotal story. Uh, Ron Perkinson owns Lucia Topkins, a friend of mine, and he used to leave his 50 BMG and people could pay a hundred dollars to shoot three shots. And they, so they roll a carpet out and they, they'd set it up on the carpet and you'd actually be shooting under the regular counter at, at the range or whatever. And of course they would have people sign an additional waiver for that. Oh, yeah. I wasn't there for this, but I, I got there shortly thereafter. Some guy didn't sign the waiver. He's lying on the ground. The, the RSO was instructing him on it. And I don't know how he did this, but somehow he was so scared of what was coming, kind of like what you mentioned, Randy, being prepared for that. He you know, anticipated. Yep. And he pulled it and pulled the barrel up like this. Oh and it went straight up, <laughs> hit the ceiling, and came down on an angle, went directly through the $6,000 carrier, which is oh. the carrier, which is why you had to sign the extra oh waiver. Oh, my God. And he didn't sign the extra waiver. Oh wow. my like, I'm not paying for that. <laughs> well, in the beauty of a, of a system like that, too, is if you want to, you can train in your own house. If you're thinking about, okay, if I have to defend my house, you can move. You go, okay, how long does it take me to get from this cover to that cover? If I'm sitting here, what do I have? You know, what part of the, the house or the street or anything can I, can I overlook? And it really gives you a sense of how you move through your own space. Even and in the dark. You, you, know, you train in your backyard. Water. Most people don't. Yeah. Well, I, I train indoors when it's raining or or if I want to do some night stuff and I'll have all the lights off in the house other than my weapon mounted light when I need it. But here's another aspect to it, Jeff, that speaks to what the topic you just raised. I'll do it in my bare feet, boxer shorts and bare feet. <clears throat> Likely that's the scenario that I would encounter, right? Three o'clock in the morning, that's exactly how you're going to be. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I think I, I don't do it and with my wife around she'd probably freak out but I think about if I heard a crash in my house at two or three in the morning and I get up and I have my weapon okay he's not in my bedroom but he's somewhere which means I have to clear my house yeah. yes and so how do I systematically where do I go first how do I do that what do I tell my wife you know like and I've always told her I said you know she has a revolver and I said if someone's coming at you and it ain't me you keep you pull the trigger till it quits going bang, um, but you gotta. Am I? You know, I've got to move back through the you know the guest bedroom through my office. You know, are they in the laundry room? Are they in the garage? But you know, you've got to be able to think through your mind. How do I clear my house? Well, if you have a system like that, you can practice that. That's right. It, there's well, another to, angle. To, to. Sorry, go ahead, Randy, and then I'll make my point. Go ahead. I was gonna say you need to practice that. You know what I mean? Because one, trying to clear your house and find a manner that you can do it. So hopefully you don't, you know, have some 8,000 square foot house. So when you start on one side and do all of it, you know, it's all clear. You know yeah. what I mean? There's a way you can figure that pathway <clears> out. <throat> so you don't have to worry about now I came back into this area. Maybe somebody is in here because they've been moving around at the same time that I have. Or, yeah, they got this or behind you. Yeah. Or, or the rule of plus one. That's right. You've already ran this one guy down. You've cleared it down here, but there's always one more guy, right? That's the mentality. Everybody. The yeah. rule of plus one, there's always one more. Even if you think it's clear, you convince yourself there's still one more rule of plus one. You guys are animal lovers like Cindy and I, uh, you, especially dogs. Yeah. And we're empty nesters. And my fear is, is that, Randy, do you remember, I want to say it, maybe around 2010, something like that, there was a gang in DFW that was breaking into people's homes and setting dogs on fire with the aerosol cans. No, because I wasn't here, but man, that's crazy. Yeah, it, it was it was happening in Arlington, Grand Prairie, like really the cent center of the Metroplex, Fort Worth, of course, as well. Beach Street in Fort Worth. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. Anybody who knows Fort Worth knows that a bad yeah, Beach Street here in, in, in the Volusia County area where all the homes are five plus million dollars. Uh, Beach Street in, in Fort Worth is the exact opposite. But anyway, my <laughs> fear is, is that we have two senior dogs. They're very protective of us. They've never bit anybody, but they're protective, especially of their mama, is that they get hurt. And I'm not going to allow that to happen. Yep, so, yeah. you know, it's up to me, like you said, Jeff, to, to clear your house and clear the danger sort of thing. Yeah. If you haven't practiced that, it's, you also, the bad guy's got the element of surprise. You're in bed, you're asleep, you wake up, you're groggy, you may not be able to see perfectly, you're certainly not wearing 
any of your tactical gear, like you're just grabbing an implement yep. and trying to protect yourself and your family. So uh, I, I, the biggest thing I wanted to mention out of all that though, was really, and my brother-in-law taught me this is that uh, the, the rule of plus one, it doesn't matter if a cop is pulled somebody over to the side of the road and they can see in the car until they've actually cleared the car. There's always one more rule of plus right. one. Yeah. And the same thing applies in your home. Never assume. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, some guy in our, and we have a very kind of a rural area and everybody knows everybody and there's only one way in. We had a guy who came into our neighborhood through the desert in the middle of the night and he was kind of roaming around and nobody knew who he was. He kind of, when I found him, he kind of looked like a biker dude, but we had a, a neighbor who's a single woman in her sixties and she'd had a door left open. And so she didn't want to go into her house because if the guy was in there. So I, you know, took my handgun, went up there, and I, with her behind me, I had to clear her house. It is very awkward to clear a space that you really don't know. I'd have been over a house, a couple of different That's rooms, extremely hard. all the different back bedrooms and closets and hallways and stuff. And, you know, you have to clear every room, look through every closet, look under the bed, you know, because the guy could be hiding somewhere. And it's disconcerting when you think there's some, okay, there's a potential bad guy in this house. Because mm -hmm. you've got to basically look at every human sized space where they might be. So if you do that in your own home and you say, okay, yeah, someone could be crouching behind here, someone could be hiding and you wouldn't see them because of chairs or something, of the furniture, you got to think about that. So when you have to do it at three in the morning with low light, you have an idea of what you're doing. And, and so we started with flashlights, you know, we're working our way up the food chain here and implements uh, worthwhile mentioning that you're, you're, you should have weapon mounted lights, pistols, ARs, whatever the case may be, because it, it in that situation, Jeff, that you were in there, what happens if, if say she had adult children who had come over to visit her and she wasn't there and you didn't get positive ID and, and all of a sudden, you have a really bad situation on your hands. That's why a weapon yeah. mount light is so important. You got to have PID before you pull the trigger. So yeah. good point. So let, let's move up to the, the next level. And it, and it's really not crazy expensive in the grand scheme of things. And no, this is not the equivalent of an airsoft rifle. So this is uh, the uh, unit four from unit solutions. This is an AR training uh, device. It is classified not as a firearm by the ATF. The lower has been modified. This can never be turned into a functioning AR, but it's built from AR parts. So this is almost a carbon copy of one of the 300 SBRs that I sleep beside because I believe I'm practicing the way that you play. This has very realistic uh, kickback recoil that you're not going to get out of an airsoft gun. It has these really... Uh, super stout magazines that have been dropped 300 times from shoulder height on a cement floor and with zero malfunctions. They take these really interesting cartridges and they don't, they have 30 rounds. So same as a regular AR magazine. So you're not, don't have an airsoft gun, you know, that's got a hop or anything like that with the hundreds of rounds. There's CO2 left in these after you shoot the 30 rounds because that's how they maintain the velocity of four to 425 feet per second. And I've measured them on a, both of our chronographs and got those results. These are man marking rounds. So uh, the gold standard for years on man marking rounds was UTM. And our current uh, administration has deemed these as uh, illegal to sell to anybody but law enforcement and military. They have a primer in them. Uh, they shoot a projectile about 400 feet per second. It's pretty realistic training. But now that you can't get those as private individual, this is by far and away the best option. Uh, they're $699. And I will mention like a lot of this equipment we're going through, we have discount codes down below in, in the video description. Uh, so you can get 10% uh, off one of these. So I, I think it works out like $620, $630. Uh, so the other advantage from a training perspective is, again, all of the controls are exactly the same as a regular AR. So you can run a mag out, drop it, do a mag change, carry on. Charging handle works so you can simulate, you know, clearing, a, you know, a stovepipe or a jam. 
Uh, this is not a real silencer, by the way, or not a suppressor, I should say. It's just meant to give you the form factor. But I weighed myself with this, and then I weighed myself with one of my live fire SBRs with a full magazine, and it was within one pound. So probably within the margin of error and the scale that I was using. So extremely realistic. I, I This is really innovative stuff. These guys are going to be bringing out a pistol, by the way, later this year, which I can't wait to get my hands on. But I know of no more realistic training rifle than this. And I got a bunch of crap on my desk here. I have a piece of pick rail on this side so I can put a pec deck on here if I'm using uh, my night vision, which is identical to my live fire SBRs. But if I don't have a pec deck on there, I could put the Mantis X10 on this and connect it to my phone. Now I've got double the goodness, right? So I got the feedback from the Mantis. These are man marking rounds, but they will ring steel silhouettes. And if you use the kinetics, they really ring the steel. So now you get it all. Like the one thing with the, the Mantis that if I'm going to fault it is, if I'm shooting on the run and I've got, you know, mono vision, I don't have any depth because I'm blind in my left eye. And I'm looking through this holographic sight, running forwards and keeping this on target is a challenge when you only have vision out of one eye. So the barrel might be moving around more than I would care for it to be moving when I'm running forwards. And so this will score me maybe 50, 60%. But if I'm ringing steel and a silhouette's this big, that's kill zone. And I, I know at least I'm on the right path sort of thing. So this has taken my training to a whole new level. So uh, Randy, I'll, I'll start with you because you know, you've know you done a lot of AR dry fire training. It's Special Forces Green Beret. Give me your thoughts on this type of rig. Well, kind of like what I said earlier, you know, using the exact platform or something very, very similar that you're using as in real, then, you know, that's, that's what you want to do because you, you, just as you mentioned, you know, all those little intricacies of where the different parts are, how long the rifle is, the trigger pull, you know, the kick of it, all that matters, what optic you're using and uh to train with the same thing you're going to go out with it, it's it's what we did in the military and that's why because you want to train with what you're going to use there's no sense i mean you'll get some training out of using a platform that's completely different than that mm -hmm. but as we mentioned you know that's that repetition in those rounds and you were talking about we were saying you know professional shooters shoot 50 to sixty thousand rounds a year and it's for that reason you know they're using the same gun all the time and so it, it what is it i think ten thousand repetitions is what it takes for you to master something or that comes from like martial arts okay you know, it'll be a kick or a punch it's the same thing with shooting and then using the exact gun that you're going to use or a replica that's very very close you you know that's that's what you want that would be if, if you had the pinnacle and this is you had everything you wanted that you would want to use what you're going to be using it, and is I've used a lot of different systems. And in my opinion, this is the pinnacle. I was super excited when we got a couple of these. We can do force on force training with it as well, which is why, you know, these are blue man marking rounds, but you get red ones as well. So you get red team, blue team. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you have two teams. <laughs> and it's water soluble. Yep. Uh, so you can shoot it in the house. It won't wreck your uh, sheet rock. It just wipes off the walls. Uh, I got shot in the back at, at 10 yards with two of these. Cindy double tapped it. A little, and again, these aren't as hard as the kinetic rounds. And I was, the plan was, is take two of these in the back, then two kinetics. And it was like, yeah, that ain't going to happen after <laughs> you guys have seen the video <laughs> Two two of these in the back yeah. didn't tickle at all, but training inside your house with these, what a huge advantage, just like Jeff, what you're referring to. If, if you haven't practiced clearing a house, whether it's yours or not, and you think you're going to do it under stress after you just got woken up in the middle of the night, that's a tall order, right? Yeah, it is. So it's I not a good place to be. It's yeah, not it's, to anytime be. you're clearing anything <laughs> in a potentially <laughs> real situation, that's right. It's stressful. Yeah. So I got one more uh training implement that's actually more than a training implement. And that's the Berna uh mission for less lethal rifle. So this guy, pretty much from the buffer tube forward, is identical to an AR controls. I mean, this is all from uh, M-Lock. 
And the only thing that's really different is instead of a buffer tube, you've got an 88 or a 90 gram CO2 cartridge in it. And this shoots a larger, like half inch projectiles uh, that hurt like hell as well, because I've taken these too. Uh, but this is actually intended for a less lethal home defense as well. You can buy these biodegradable rounds for this that cost pennies that are great to shoot. They just poof, they turn into powder when you hit the steel or they just, the water breaks them down outside, which makes it fairly affordable. This is a little bit more expensive than the last rifle I showed, but it is dual purpose. You could use this for less lethal self-defense, home defense, and not just training. Whereas the, the last rifle I showed, I don't think I'd want to use that if somebody breaks into my house, put it that way. Whereas this one shooting CS rounds. So Jeff, why don't you uh, expand on that a little bit? So this shoots kinetic rounds, the biodegradable rounds, as well as CS rounds. So, and you've been exposed. Well, I think, yeah, uh, I think we all have at some point. Um, yeah, I, I think Randy called, uh, you know, pepper spray and CS is the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> um, you know, you get shot in the back with a kinetic round from a, one of those, or you get shot with a, you know, a paintball, and which can really hurt, by the way, take it from me. Um, it, yeah, it hurts, but you're up and you're running again. You're not incapacitated, not very long anyway. CS, pepper spray, depending on how good they hit you with it, you're down for the count. Yeah. You can't see, you can't breathe, you rub your eyes, and all you're doing is rubbing it deeper into your eyes. No, you're you're messed up. So that is a good intense. weapon. And if you talk about you know, distance is your friend when you have it when you have an, a, an enemy. You hit them with that. You have plenty of time to get the hell away from them, assuming they're not just running away from you. We've done some interesting tests with the CS rounds where Denny Chapman stood beside a silhouette target, and I hit the silhouette target with the CS, and it still smoked them standing beside it. Like you don't even have to hit the person; you just have to hit something close enough to cause that you know CS round to basically deploy. It's a chemical hand grenade. Close is good enough. <laughs> Randy, your thoughts on CS? Because I know you've had well, it. So, so I love that thing. But honestly, in my opinion, if it's in my home, I'm not going to use a less. If somebody's breaking my home and now I'm compromised in my family, the le a, a less than lethal, I'm not picking up. Because one, I probably don't know yet what they have, right? The bad guy. I don't know what kind of a weapon, if he has any weapon. So, you know, it's like the old adage, don't bring a, a knife to a gunfight, you yeah. know, uh, or when we've seen law enforcement officers that got in trouble because they pulled that taser first and then tried to use it and said bad guy pulled out a gun and shot him. So, but other than that, I think it's a great training aid. And I think that, you know, if you had a situation where you needed riot control, that would be a perfect thing for it. So I just to play devil's advocate here, uh, Dr. Jen, Dr. Jennifer Stankus, her and her husband, pardon me, are emergency room doctors in Tacoma, but they live in Vegas. So they, oh, wow. they for seven days to Washington to work, they have a home there. Then they fly back to Vegas for the next week to take off. And they no longer take live fire weapons to Washington state because of the laws and the district attorneys. So they don't have a very good uh, castle doctrine there, okay? So That's a very good point. Very if good somebody point. breaks in and you shoot them, you're getting charged with homicide 99% right. of the time there. But also Luan Pham, who's the, the chief marketing officer, chief revenue officer for Berna, said to me, uh, one instance where maybe it's not the mission, maybe it's the launcher, which is their pistol, is that if you had an intruder and you shot a less lethal projectile at them and then shot them with a regular round, there's probably not a jury in the entire country that would convict you because you tried to use less lethal before using fully lethal in one of those crazy George Soros back jurisdictions. I don't know. It make, makes my head spin. Cause I'm with you. Like you, somebody breaks in, they're getting high speed lead poisoning End the story. Um, you know, we're yeah, not, especially with less lethal, but I, I, I would never live in a jurisdiction like that. Like you couldn't pay me enough money to live in California, Illinois, New York, or any of those other places like that. Well, that's why I stay in my great state of Texas for that very reason. Well, there's two other things to consider with the Berna as well. Okay. What if they're in your yard? Yeah. 
Texas, yeah, if someone's stealing out of your yard in the middle of the night, you still you used to be able to still shoot them. But, I don't know that I would in this day and time. I probably you're right. If I would probably if that yeah, were the case, even if they were still in my truck. Yeah. Or they're probably not gonna long, you, know, you pop them with a burn up, they're gonna right. leave and your stuff is still That's there. Right. That's the right. other one is you get people who just will not and cannot think, even contemplate shooting another human being. Right. And that's I correct. Understand it. Don't agree with it, but I understand it. And in those cases, a burna is better than nothing because that's, that's right. what they would have. Nothing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Those were both very solid points that I didn't consider because, you know, I'm in Texas and I'm thinking about my house. Yeah. Well, well if they're in your house, yeah. The all bets are off. Your rights end at my threshold. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, Randy, I agree with you 100%. Uh, you know, fortunately, we split our time. We, you know, have a home in Georgia and a home here in Florida, and we have very good castle doctrines and we have very good stand your ground laws. We're also smart enough to know that you don't ever shoot somebody in the back. I mean, that's a guaranteed. Yeah, not even once. Yeah, don't pass, go, don't collect 200 bucks, go straight no. to jail sort of thing. And, you, and if you haven't played this through in your mind, you know, there are instances where somebody has not been prepared for it that level of situation and, and they have shot somebody in the back and uh they ended up going to jail over it, even in a state like texas or florida oh so, yeah no yeah yeah this, but this is the pistol uh version it's called the launcher and believe it or not and i've measured them both again on our chronographs the pistol velocity is exactly the same as the rifle is because you got to remember when you have something that's pneumatically powered the projectile actually loses velocity as it goes down the barrel. It doesn't gain velocity. There's no gunpowder behind it yeah. exploding, expanding, and, and throwing that inertia forwards. So the, the rifle more accurate from a little bit more distance, but as far as the punch is concerned, the, the launcher, the pistol that you see on screen, uh, just as good. So I want to move into just a couple quick things before we, we we jump into training resources and what people's options are. Uh, this is a, a Mira, I think it's a CM8M or something like that mask. It's one of their top of the line masks though. And I will do training with this. I pr should probably do it more than I do. It has nothing to do with stress on my cardio and has everything to do with claustrophobia. If you're running, doing exercises and shooting guns back to back and wearing something like this in the Florida sunshine and heat, I'll tell you what, like the first time I tried it, like whatever, way back, um, I did, couldn't make it through five circuits. I got through three circuits and I had to rip it off. I was so claustrophobic. I thought I was going to die. And my watch was reporting my heart rate. I want to say it was like 110, 115 range. But if you're going to have a gas mask which everybody should have gas masks they're not that expensive and provide a ton of protection in all kinds of different scenarios i will recommend this one over the other brands and i'm not going to mention the other brands because we're not in the business of hurting other people's businesses but randy you'll appreciate this being special forces see this indentation below the viewport yep you can actually get a cheek weld with this when you're shooting oh, yeah. a carbine or an sbr the other nice. one guess what that's right you yeah. can't get a cheek weld and, and so you've got the gas mask on and you're yeah. trying to you know you never ever should put your head down to an optic right you always bring the optic up to your eye level you can't you can't shoot when you can't get a cheek weld so this is really smart on the part of mira to put this indentation in here I, i'll tell you what i can my accuracy with this versus the other brands is an order of magnitude difference it have either of you guys done any any training or live fire anything like that with a mask on? I have not. Yeah, but not like that mask. It was like the older ones, like you said. You can't really. You more or less were pointing it. You know what I mean. You couldn't really get a cheek weld and get on in there and, and look down the sights or through an optic. And for uh, for new people or people who are just getting into this stuff, that's a cheek weld right there. Yes. So the rifle comes up. Your optic comes up to eye level. It, nothing worse than watching somebody hold a gun like this, try to shoot like that instead of bringing it up. Like I've had people say, well, you don't even have the the brace in the pocket. Well, yeah, I do. I have it in the pocket where it belongs so I can get a cheek weld and see properly. But if you can't do that with a gas mask, the accuracy no, it comes up. down to a sight picture and alignment. 
Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Which, which is probably like you guys, I'm sure uh, when you started shooting and since then probably recommend to other people when you have a, a rifle and whether you have an angled foregrip, a, a vertical grip or whatever is pointing your finger at the target, you know, it, it's so you have that directional accuracy just from pointing your finger will keep you more accurate than trying to like do a complete C clamp around the, the handguard. It's something that's cemented in your brain and our DNA basically, because we point all the time. You've done it since you right. were a kid and you can point right exactly what you're thinking about or looking at or talking. So that pointing kind of helps to that transition where now you're lining everything up. Exactly. Yeah. And Jeff, you have any comments on that? No, I mean, I, I haven't had to try and train in a mop suit or anything like that. <laughs> but yeah, everything you said makes perfect sense. You didn't miss much. You have to maintain, you have to get the sight picture. If you can't get a sight picture, you're, you're basically throwing darts. I, that's when you walk it in. That's what we would do. You would shoot yeah. around in front of them and walk it into them. Yeah. I, I, I had a guy well, you have a laser projected laser sight and you still put right. red dot yeah. on and pull the trigger. That's right. Yeah. I had a guy on one of my sales teams who he liked the concept of owning guns and shooting guns, but he was very unskilled. And he had, had a further complication of being right handed, but his dominant eye was his left eye. Oh, yeah. So, so and he didn't buy expensive optics, right? So the there's a huge difference in performance of glass. You guys know this because you've fired all types of different different glass. Some people who are new to this may not realize is the eye relief, meaning how close or far away from the scope can you actually get that sight picture and be in focus. So higher quality stuff, uh, maybe not the ACOGs, but other Trigicon stuff like LPVOs in particular, I mean, I've got a Trigicon Credo. I swear to God, it's got a five, six inch eye relief on it. It's absolutely beautiful to, to put that on a carbine because I don't have to get up on it. So this guy had cheap optics with about an inch of relief and he was left eye dominant. So Matt, if you think of that, it's kind of like an elephant humping a football sort of thing, like pretty contorted. And I suppose that this, like, this doesn't count for me because I have a prosthetic eye, but I'll just throw this little tip out there, which Denny Chapman taught me many years ago. Pick, pick a pick a tree or a, a a pole something off in the distance and put your hands like this and That's look right. that center section with both eyes close your left eye th then open it close your right eye whichever eye can still see that object through there that's your dominant eye well what you can do too is you just hold it straight out and then bring it right back to your face it will that automatically too. go to your dominant eye because yep. that's the one you're looking for that's that's a good point randy I, absolutely so was your friend was he ever in the military i'm assuming not uh so law enforcement and yeah. national uspa shooting champion several times and world yeah. so Cowboys did he shoot right-handed that way oh no too? sorry i'm talking the guy who taught me this no 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 no, no, no on no, my no. sales team oh yeah no, no, no oh yeah no, no because those it, guys could never get their weapon centered at base in, in brm basic riflemanship and in it was actually <laughs> it, it was unnerving to the point for everybody else that they would typically leave him in one action bay and we would go to another action bay. Yeah, yeah. There's huge berms in between them for that yeah. reason. That, that's right. Okay, let, <laughs> let's keep talking implements here, especially as we get ready to get into like more uh, physical training. So uh, this is a, a simple bulletproof vest. Uh, bulletproof zone is the vendor. We get sent a lot of stuff like this. I will say this has got... Uh, probably the nicest stitching in it of all the ones we've been sent, but we typically don't get sent a lot of this stuff because as some people know, we've been following us for a while, uh, three A soft body armors rated up to a 44 Magnum. We've hit it with 10 millimeter, 1690 foot per second, 90 grain, 10 mil with no problems. But uh, our good friend, James from Pilgrim Ammo, any type of three A soft body armor, 50 grain, 2000 foot per second, nine mil will shred these things. But I will wear this, sometimes when I'm training in the Florida heat, because if, if I was going to wear any type of protection, uh, this would most likely be what it is. And I know you guys have some comments on this. I Apparently I was incorrectly informed years ago that generally speaking, level four plates and plate carriers were for driving trucks and defending positions. But Randy's got way more experience than I do. 
So this rig here with only two mags in it, it is about 27 pounds and it's got level four ceramic plates in it. So when you load it up with a few more mags, uh, it doesn't take much to get this well over 40 pounds, put a radio on it, so on and so forth. I don't train in this in the hot Florida heat. I do train in the soft body armor, like this uh, bulletproof zone stuff. Randy, give me your thoughts, because clearly I was wrong to assume that it was for driving and uh, defending positions, the hard stuff. But you guys apparently did that in 100 plus degree weather in Iraq. Oh, yeah. All the way up to 140. Wow. You know, it's, so whether I was a private in the infantry or I was a Green Beret on an ODA, you had that vest on, you know, and uh, the ones the military use and the one I have in my closet, the one I had on when I got injured. Uh, the plates are 40 pounds by themselves. You put the front and the back, that's 40 pounds in the vest already. Oh, and then you add all the the ammo and magazines. Uh, we had a med kit. You've got scissors. You've got a flashlight. I mean, and, and, uh, and uh, any assorted other little things that you've added to your kit. My water, vest weighed over water. 70 pounds by itself. Oh, yeah. Water, that water. Added water. That was before water. Right. This thing weighed 70 pounds before Damn. I added water. And I always added water because I've seen too many people, you know, uh, start getting cramps or even dry heaving, certainly over the overseas, you know what I mean? Moving around, even at night, it's still a hundred degrees. So, uh, you never get out of the heat. In fact, even on my team, when we were back here training, getting ready to go, we ran 35 miles a week and the shortest day was Wednesday. It was only three and a half miles. It was out in calf country on, uh, Fort Campbell. But there was this huge hill about halfway or a little past halfway that we had to run up. And the reason we only ran three and a half miles because it was best day. That was the day you showed up for PT gotcha. with a full vest. Now, we didn't have ammo in the magazines, but we had the magazines in the in the pouches and you had your plates in. And we ran that three and a half miles with that, with that on for that very reason. Because then you get real world. You start having to go do stuff just like what you said. Well, I sure wish I didn't have to wear it. You know, but uh, also I never got shot in the chest either, which would have been, you know, uh, a good reason to have one of those on. So like, check this out. I mean, this is this is a higher end level four plate that I've got pulled up here. Uh, you know, three hundred twenty dollars per plate. It's pretty good price, actually. But yeah. those are eight pounds a piece. And that that's a higher end. You know, the more expensive they are, the less they weigh for the same protection of level four. But you're going to be sixteen and a half pounds just in two high-end plates there and then again water magazines ammo everything else that goes with it it adds up fast for sure and you should train with them because if you ever think you're actually going to have to use it you probably should train in it so again it's not the first it's no different than you know you're not going to go your the weapon you have next to your bed you fired many times it's not going to be a brand new or a gun that you've never fired that's not the the tool that you're going to go grab in a moment's notice. And the okay. same thing with this, if you're going to, if you think you would ever have to use a vest, you probably should do some training in it. So you know what it feels like moving around in it, you know, how tired you're going to get and all kinds of things. And, and even shooting in it with the vest on was completely different. You know, without the vest, I could, you know, uh, the problem is the big plates we had on those, your shoulder plate and chest plate came up to right here. So now you're putting your gun in a little different position. That's right. So you check have to train that way. So check this out, guys. Uh, so we just looked at those level four plates. Like you said, your total rig, 70 pounds. Um, this guy here, you know, this bulletproof vest that I've got, total weight, 2.5 pounds. Yeah. Now, doesn't have protection against rifle rounds. But if this is what you most commonly would see, you know, for most law enforcement officers, unless they're SWAT team, those sort of things. But two and a half pounds versus 70 pounds. Yep. Call it 50 pounds when you take the uh, some of the stuff out of the equation. It's, it's a huge difference for sure. And it's all part of that stress inoculation, right? Like if you can if you can stand 100 plus degree weather, 140 degree weather with all of that crap on, you know. Oh, yeah. Imagine. Well, how you train the same way that you're going to fight. You yes. know, and obviously when I was in, in when I was a, in the infantry or as a Green Beret, I was going overseas and your enemy common enemy is carrying an AK 47 back here in the United States, certainly for law enforcement, 
it's going to be a pistol. By far and large, the percentages. Of course, there are people that use shotguns and AKs here too, but predominantly it's the pistol that everybody's using. Yeah, exactly, for sure. So I just want to briefly touch on, on one more implement and then we're going to get into the training resources. Give me your comments on knives. You know, carrying knives, using the knife as a protection weapon, all those sort of things. Jeff? I, I, I generally don't carry a knife. Um, for this, Well, I mean, I'll have like a Leatherman or something like that, I guess, but uh, it's not a defense weapon. Um, I don't carry knives because if you're using it, you're too damn close. Yeah. You know, if someone's coming to me with a knife and I don't have a knife, I'm getting the hell out of there. For sure. Uh, distance is your best friend. What are your thoughts, Randy? Well, knives like anything else, it is a good tool. There's a lots of reasons to have a knife, but as far as self-defense wise, you know, uh, how many people are proficient with a knife in today's time? Not many. And even all the people you see carrying around knives, only a small percentage of them are actually proficient with that knife. The problem is you pull out a knife to defend yourself and they have a gun, you're in big trouble. Or if you pull out a knife and they're proficient with the knife, you're in real trouble with that situation as well. So unless you're extremely proficient with the knife and you're one of those that's just a knife person, it probably not shouldn't be your go-to. Yeah, good, good advice. I also think that there's an element of uh, psychology to this. I, in my mind, it's always been... It's bad enough when somebody's a murderer and they shot somebody else, but when somebody stabbed somebody multiple times, that just seems to me like well, a whole that's, another that's very level. personal, yeah, yeah very very personal. other level of evilness to do something like that. Like, um, I don't. If somebody broke into our home, I wouldn't hesitate. I mean, I've been in enough fights. I know I would not hesitate, but I can never see myself crossing that line to stabbing somebody unless it was stab or be stabbed. You know. Yeah, and he, even then, that's a that's a kind of tough thing to consider. So let, let's get into some of the uh, resources that people uh, can exercise, bad pun, but exercise from a training perspective. So uh, Jeff brought a website up earlier. Uh, so PDN, Personal Defense Network. And Jeff, tell me what drew you to PDN. I know they've got a bunch of good stuff, but I want to hear it directly from you. Well, I was just doing uh, some general searches and brought these up, and they've got a, a number of videos. Some are free uh, and are pretty basic, and then others are, you know, you have to subscribe to, and I guess there's more detail. But it goes, you know, it's a lot of, uh, the, the one I was looking at today was, you know, g getting over that, that initial flinch, like you've been surprised, and then... You know, deciding, you know, drawing your weapon and then deciding whether to fire. And he had one where, you know, he fired and then he drew again and then has it and then didn't fire. And he said the reason he didn't is the angle of the shot, what's behind it. And he goes, you know, I, I've got to look at, like we said, rounds miss. More rounds will miss and they will hit. Well, where are they going? Once a bullet leaves the barrel, it has no friends. So you've got to think about, you know, again it's like a sight picture you've got to say okay what am i shooting and what's behind it when i miss and yeah and you don't see that covered in a lot of these and i thought that was a good a good point to bring up yeah i agree 100 percent uh they've got i i had a look at it after you brought the website to my attention they have a broad broad range of subjects and yeah. training and I mean, a lot of this stuff is for free, so you can go and yeah. study it online. And then if you have some of the implements that we've already discussed, you can do this free training, you know, in your home, your backyard, those sort of things. It doesn't cost you anything but time, of course. Randy, give me your thoughts on uh, starting out with something like uh, watching videos and, and mimicking the drills at home so that for the people who don't have hundreds or thousands of dollars to spend on professional training. No, I, well, it's a great idea for one because it's free, and uh, and it, it, a site like this or any reputable place, you know, uh, they're going to be putting out good information, and so uh, and it will just. I think it's it's really good if you're just starting out. You know what I mean? And again, you don't have a ton of money. Uh, you're going to need to know certain drills, certain way to handle things, and how to handle a gun and and shoot it because as Jeff said, uh, you know. Um, he, well, to his point, you got to know what's behind there because 
you know, it's one of the things that I talked about with my kids and even the roommate I have now, there's me and my brother are here. What would we do if somebody came in? How are you going to handle that? So we're not shooting at each other. But the yeah. other part is once that round leaves the barrel, it's, it doesn't have a friend and you're still responsible for it. And, you know, I live in a neighborhood, my, my next door neighbors are right on the other side of my house. So, you know, uh, I think it's a good idea to find some sort of professional level of training, you know, so that gives you an idea and kind of a, a route of where you need to go. Like you said, you've used all those training models to now where you, plat you plateaued on one. Now you move to another. It's the same thing, a, a transit, uh, trans or, you know, the progression of drills. And mm -hmm. not everybody has that. You're probably not going to be able to just go buy a book. But there's plenty of stuff online. This isn't the only website. There's a ton of them out today. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. you just need it, to find some good information so that you can implement those drills and those safety habits yourself so that you know. And, and a lot of them um, are for the beginners. You know, They say, this is how you clean your gun. This yeah. is the stuff you need to clean your gun. This is why you clean your gun. Um, or this is how you draw. These are the five steps of drawing, a, you know, and you know, get a good, good grip. This is the grip that you, you know, you want when you hold a, a firearm. Because people who buy guns for the first time, I have a neighbor who just bought two after he went shooting with us. He went out and bought two guns. He doesn't, he hadn't fired him yet. And I said, well, that doesn't do you any good. But he's a, he is a beginner's beginner. So he yeah. needs to, you know, we're showing him, you know, about, you know, gun, basic gun safety, about, you know, you got to clean the gun. You know, you, you never point the gun at something you don't intend to shoot. You assume every gun is un, is loaded when you pick one up. You know, all these, just the stuff that you, you know, our grandpas taught us when we were 12. But, um, but there's videos for all that online. They, you know, they will, from the most basic stuff up to much more advanced stuff like, you know, clearing a room and shooting, you know, uh, behind obstructions, that kind of stuff. So there's a ton out there. I, yeah, including myself. clearing the gun if you hand it to someone, you know what I mean? Clear it, leaving yeah. it open. You should check it when somebody hands you a gun. All those rules that people don't know if they've never been around guns. or guns. Yeah, like always look twice. You look, at, you know, you rack it, <laughs> you look at the, you know, you look at the chamber, you look away, you look again. Now, I still do that. I was taught that years and years and years ago, and I still do it as habit now. Every yeah. time I look, I look away and look again. Yeah, safety, good safety, safety. Yeah. yeah. Or you stick your finger in the. <laughs> you make sure. You make yeah. sure. You don't just That's get cool. it. You make sure. <laughs> yeah. I was going to add to what you guys said. So I've take, I've watched videos and taken pieces from it that are applicable to me and then put them into my own drills. So yeah. you it's not like you have to find somebody else's drills and do them verbatim. You can make your own drills up. And here's the, like for myself, just because I'm extremely tight on time, instead of going to the gym anymore, which I did for many decades, I would rather run and gun and do exercises in between each shooting session. It elevates my heart rate. I'm getting stress inoculation. I'm getting exercise. So dumbbells, bands, push-ups, body weight exercises. And so I'm typically in the, you know, high 130s range. My heart rate doesn't go much over that no matter how gassed I get. But that in itself has dramatically improved my shooting. Like it, it's at the point now where I get bored just standing there shooting because it's 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 oh, not I can't even do that anymore. I can't it's not a challenge. Yeah, yeah. You know, sort of thing. So but bottom line is there's all these great resources out there that are free. You can either mimic them or modify them get the right implements, even again, if it's something, you know, as economical as a $20, $25 airsoft gun, it'll still put you in a better position than if you weren't doing it. There, there's some other types of training that I just want to bring up here because it's, it's good stuff to know. So our friends over here at Forward Observer, it's called the Gray Zone, but this is the guys from Forward Observer. So they do in-person and online training for area study workshops. And I believe we brought this up either in the last SDN or the one before that. And Mike Sterling's done this. I've sat through some of their online stuff. It's absolutely amazing what you will learn uh, when you study this as far as your local surroundings are concerned, that you kind of need to know this stuff before something bad kicks off. And so I, I can't rec recommend these guys enough. These are I think Mike Sterling said it something to the effect of 
these guys have it down pat. Like they go to forwardobserver.com. There's probably other guys out there doing this stuff, but I don't know of anybody who's as recommended frequently like forward observer is and does stuff at their level. Jeff, you're an Intel guy. You know, how important is that Intel, especially in your immediate area, if oh, yeah. it's the fan? Well, okay. I live in a I live in the desert. And the last thing you want to do is try to get across the desert at night because you'll end up being a pincushion. So, you know, there's you know, I there's multiple ways. Actually, there's only one road into my neighborhood, but I know at least four or five other foot routes out of my neighborhood that I could confidently get my way through and get out of here. I can guarantee you none of my neighbors do, except maybe one. Um, but you gotta know where your neighbors are. You got to know who your neighbors are. You know, are they someone you can depend on in a pinch or are they just going to be a lead weight? Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to know if there is something going to go bad happen, how are the bad guys going to get there? Um, you know, and how do you defend against that? You know, do you need to have a 360 perimeter or maybe you only need a 180 degree perimeter because there's no way anyone could get behind you. Uh, but these are things you need to walk your neighborhood, walk your area, Maybe when you're walking your dogs or jogging, but look at it with an eye of, okay, if something bad happened, you know, could I go there? Could someone get to me from there? And look at everything tactically. Good advice, Randy. Yeah, I would say uh, I, I definitely agree with all that. You know, um, uh, we never did anything in the military. And again, it didn't matter if I was a private in the infantry or I was in special operations without Intel. And certainly by the time when you're a private, you don't get to make a lot of decisions. They just kind of tell you, you go here, you do this. But once I got up, you know, certainly into special operations and more rank, we didn't go anywhere without an area study, multiple area studies, in fact. Hmm. And then a lot of Intel, you don't do anything without that. So really you shouldn't in your own, personal sector also because you know it's the same reason why criminals do things in their own neighbor because they're comfortable there you should know your whole area to where you're comfortable and as jeff said you have you know all kind of egress routes uh and and plans of you know it's the same old adage in baseball right when that pitcher starts his wind up everybody else on the field has to know what they're going to do with the ball if it's hit to them right then you have to know what you're going to do beforehand so that, you know, you have a plan, at least even if the plan goes to crap, you had a starting point. Right. Yeah. And then, so. Good, good advice. Good advice for sure. Uh, there's a couple other uh, training resources I want to hit on here and, you know, I'm going to show my bias here, but that's okay. So this is my good friend, Tony Blower's website. He actually has a whole bunch of different websites. And this one here is an online course. Uh, called the human weapon system and it's 10 modules uh, some of them you know are, are an hour some of them are 10 minutes you could go through it over the course of a weekend if you dedicated yourself to it but tony blower teaches things uh, that nobody else teaches okay so he, he teaches people how to be more situationally aware so you can detect and avoid a problem he teaches people how to devalue themselves as a target to the bad guys and if it comes right down to it how to defend themselves. And, and so he teaches a lot of stuff where we started with this video on interrupting people's OODA loops to try and buy you time, for example. Sure. He, coined, he coined a phrase in the 90s, uh, weaponize the flinch. So when's the last time any of us had something come flying at us and we thought, oh, I should probably flinch. You don't. It's, it's autonomic, right? It just happens. So how do you train your brain that when something comes towards you like that, that you t the next action that you take puts you in better stead. And that's what this training is all about. So anybody who's been in a fist fight knows that if somebody takes a swing at you and you're on your heels trying to back up, you're in a really bad situation. And so whether you've had professional training or not, if you've got into some scuffles, like some of us, many scuffles, is that when somebody swings at you, you go towards them, not away from them. And the, the chances they'll connect actually diminish as you close that gap. And then you stand a chance of getting the next shot in on on the bad guy. But this is not martial arts. This is not going to teach you how to be a martial artist. This is not martial arts, you know, 
uh, training drills, all that sort of stuff. This is actually more training for the brain and the the, the autonomic responses they're already programmed into. And, and I'll get off of this in a second. But Tony said to me one time, he said, you know, he said he loves asking classes of, you know, people who have no training. Does anybody here know how to throw an elbow? And of course, people, they've had no training. Nobody puts their hand up. He says, you absolutely know how to throw an elbow. How many times have you got into the driver's seat, reached up here to grab your seatbelt and put it down? He said, it's the same thing that it's already burned those neural pathways. You just have to be able to convert, weaponize that flinch to, you know, take the other party off guard. You need to know how to devalue yourself. And we've told a bunch of stories about this. So because Tony is a good friend of mine, personal friend of mine, that this is a five hundred dollar course, but we have a code down below. You can't get anywhere else. It's fifty percent off. I think it comes out to like two hundred forty seven dollars. This course will make you safer. It doesn't matter who you are. And then there's a there's a companion course. It, it's a couple hundred dollars, but we have a code down below. I think it comes out to ninety seven bucks. I'm wearing the shirt. No fear. And it's it's not as comprehensive as the human weapon system, but what this does. I'm paraphrasing Tony, but he basically says, if you haven't been afraid, you can't be brave. And we're back to recognizing certain things that happen automatically in our bodies, uh, biologically, mentally, physiologically. And how how do you end up protecting yourself better as a result of that? So a couple of shameless plugs there. I'm going to hit on a couple more while I have the screen up. So this is Barrel and Hatchet. I don't have a relationship with them. Mike Sterling has actually taken a bunch of their training. They travel across the country. It's pretty reasonable. I want to say like 260 bucks for a day course. Uh, Mike took a carbine course from them a couple months ago on the Panhandle here in Florida and said that he learned more in that training session for $260 than he did in any training while he was in the military for 23 years. So According to Mike Sterling, I have no re reason to doubt them. Barrel and hatchet, really high quality stuff. One that I do have a lot of experience with or above average experience with would be WAFT, where our family's trained. This is a facility that our friend Philip DePino owns here in Central Florida. If you look it up and you try to find an address, it'll put you in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. You have to pass a background check. You have to pay fees to train here. I, in the grand scheme of things, it, it's not super expensive. You get, you know, you get what you pay for in a lot of instances, but a weekend of training uh, for $3,000, we have a discount code for 10% off. Uh, Cindy and I go here every chance that we get. We have learned more from Philip on how to uh, avoid and diffuse confrontations in public and trans, trans, what do you call them? Like transition spaces, pardon me, like uh, rest areas, gas stations than anywhere else. So I'm, I'm giving him a free plug here uh, because he deserves it. He's built one of a kind thing. Randy, I'll go to you first, and then we'll wrap up with Jeff and the conflict, conflicted question. Jeez, that's why I pass the stuff off to Mike Sterling. Give, <laughs> give, give, give me firsthand account of the value of doing hands-on, in-person, physical training with an expert trainer. Well, it, kind of what you touched on there, uh, that Mike said he learned more from them than his whole time in the military. They're going to be able to give you little secrets and little trade secrets that, you know, all these experts have that they've already went through. They've trained uh, doing them yourself. It's just like what we said, you know, uh, even in some type of self-defense measure, you need to have a repetition. You need to do it a few times. Uh, before, in case it ever happened to you in real life. You know, I liked one of the things on the first page or his page you had there. It said no fancy moves and easy to learn. That's one of the best. I mean, if it's not fancy and it's easy to learn, then you should practice that because that's what, again, if you get into a scuffle, that adrenaline is going to kick in and what's going to happen is you're going to do what your body already knows to do. And if that's a bad habit, you know, then that could be detrimental to you know, your next few minutes of life. And so uh, that's that's why you would, once you get to a certain level, you should seek out some type of professional help to polish off the rest of your training. And because they're going to give you those little things that make some of the stuff easier that you may have never, uh, never occurred to you or you didn't think of. Yeah, for sure. Uh, good advice, Randy. Jeff? Yeah, I agree with everything Randy said. I mean, if it's... Uh... 
if the training is so complicated that people aren't comfortable doing it by themselves, then it's really not worth a lot. Uh, unless you can, you know, you don't have a, a, a paid personal trainer come to your house every weekend to keep you warm. Um, but time spent training, if it's realistic and decent training, is never wasted time. That's right. You know, it's like time at the range is not a wasted is not wasted time. You know, if you're just goofing around putting let down range, it's not the most valuable time in the world either. But any time you spend building those neural pathways, getting those good habits in place to where things become, you know, more reactionary than thought driven, they almost become reflex. That takes time, and that's time well spent, though. Yes. If it's if you're Good neural pathways. You, you know, one of the most interesting things that I saw, um, I think it was the second time that we were at WAFT, was Philip was teaching these families on how to be gas station ready, like being confronted at a gas station and the, the power of using a flashlight. And he made a comment that really stuck with me because I saw it happen over and over again. He said, not only, you know, can you interrupt somebody's OODA loop by shining a flashlight at the ground or shining it in their face, he said, but the flashlight makes your voice louder because it's all, it's almost like you're pay, playing a script in, in your head, right? So, you know, in other words, you don't have a flashlight and you're like, hey, back off, get away from me. And Philip's like, back off, get away from me. You know, yeah. he, and, and I watched that transformation from some young people, 18, 19 years old girls that were getting training from Philip. And they came in meek and they didn't have the flashlight and he's teaching them how, you know, what you can accomplish with this flashlight as far as interrupting somebody's OODA loop, taking away the element of surprise and elevating your voice. Because And it also raises the question for the other guy, well, that person has this tool. What other tools do they have at, at their disposal, right? The other thing is, too, is most of us, good guys, bad guys, are going to focus on somebody's hands you know, if there's a potential threat, you're watching hands and waist, hands and waist. The people do it subliminally because, oh, holy crap, what if that guy yeah. takes a swing at me? Or what if he grabs a knife, a gun, something like that? And I'll just add one last little thing on this uh, because Tony Blower taught me this a while ago. If if you are surprised by sudden violence happening, whatever you have in your hands, you will clamp down on automatically. So, for example, if you're walking out of the grocery and you have grocery bags and somebody's going to rob you, you will clamp down on both of those. I don't ever carry anything in my predominant hand when I'm going in and out of stores or to and from the truck. And if I use a flashlight, it's always my offhand. I'm not left handed. I'm right handed. And that way, if the shit does hit the fan, I can still reach for my pistol, you know, even if this one's occupied with something else. So just a little tidbit from from Tony and, and Philip there. Anything? One thing I'd like to say to add to that is basically really people only need three or four good moves that they know well, that they can separate themselves from the bad guy and get out of there. That's reality. 100%. All right. Let's uh, let's go to our conflict. The question we'll call her out. All right. After being unjustly kicked out of your survivalist group and betrayed by your friends, you were left powerless against them. There is an opportunity to turn them into their enemies. This would put you at a great advantage and bring your friends down. Would you do it? Yes or no? And why? Jeff. Depends on what they did. They take all my stuff. If they kicked me out and, and I had all the stuff I had, I had prepared with was left behind. Yeah, I want to get my stuff back. If it's just they said take your crap and leave, we don't like you anymore. No, uh, because I you got to look at what's the benefit to me by screwing them over, even though they've kind of screwed me over. But if they haven't done me real physical harm and they haven't stolen my stuff that I need to survive, yeah, maybe not. Uh, but if they had, yeah, I'd want my stuff back. Fair so right. yeah, I'd probably do it, Randy. Well, you know, I was thinking about this from the first time you read that question. You know, I'm like, man, these this is a one heck of a card game. Uh, but I, I think I go back uh, to the biblical story. And again, like Jeff mentioned, there's no real context. You don't know what happened, how it happened, what they actually did, how they kicked you out or why. It just know, you just know that it was unjust. 
So I would go back to the bottom. I think it's uh, Jacob. I can't remember who it is now. Uh, but, you know, his, his brother sold him into slavery. And he ended up in, uh, I believe it's Egypt, you know, as a slave. And then somehow, you know, through his life, works his way up to being some great advisor to the king. And so now when his country was decimated and they had no food, his brother showed up. He was in a position to help them. And so he did that and said, you know, he didn't hold it against them. So I think I would have to follow that mold. And I would I would actually go to them and say, hey, here's here's what the options are. Here's what's going down. And, you know, and then leave it up to them to see if they're going to take me back in or whatever. I kind of leave them at their my mercy, uh, leave myself at their mercy at that point. Uh, I think that's trying to be the better person. But again, there's not a whole lot of context. You know, I don't know that they didn't steal all my stuff and beat the crap out of me and kick me out, <laughs> which could change things. <laughs> yes, it could. I think <laughs> there has to be an element of context to this as far as what your age is and where you are at this particular point in your life. So, yes. you know, I'm pretty confident in saying if this was 25 years ago, I would probably pound them into the ground without even thinking about it, even if it was the wrong decision. <laughs> You know, and that I'm not saying that it was the right decision. Most definitely at my current age, you know, mid fifties, I recognize that we have a limited amount of resources at our disposal, whether times are good or bad. There's always limits to, to resources. There's always the risk that you're going to suffer an injury. And at our age, as you know, it takes a hell of a lot longer to recover now than it did even 10 years ago. Yep. So I, I think that I'm, I'm going to try and avoid this confrontation unless it's absolutely necessary. If it's, yeah. it's not necessary, I'm going to take a pass on it. And I'm going to expend my time and energy and efforts on doing stuff that's more positive for the group that I'm in now. I mean, another concern would be is that my new group is taking my word that they mistreated me. And we go in there guns blazing. What seed gets planted with my group now that, wait a minute you know, Chris may be a little unhinged. Do we really want him in our group? You know, those sort of things. I think in this case at 55, I'm going to avoid the fight at 25. I'm going in guns blazing. So there's two answers. <laughs> I could blame it on being young and immature sort of That's thing. Right. That's right. All right, guys. <clears throat> Appreciate your time today. Appreciate your insight. Appreciate everybody out there tuning in. Please like comment, share, and subscribe. We will catch you on the next one.